a VeggieTales movie has empirically one of the best two-disc DVDs ever made. <laughs> I'm being fully serious. Like, the bonus features on that DVD are uh, on another level. That that and Monsters, Inc. are, like, the, the two DVDs against which, like, I measure all DVD bonus features. And what, you just own this movie from, like, your childhood, or did some... Did somebody give it to you? Well, I, I was I was uh, raised uh, watching Veggie Tales uh, for some reason, so uh, as, as, as a lot of us were. Yes, that so that movie uh, factored heavily. John, look, just let me. They had a full length commentary on the movie of two of of the because obviously it's an animated movie. They had two of the voice actors do a full-length commentary on the movie in character. That's dedication. Man, that's a dedication to your craft you just don't see. Shuna of Veggie Tales. It's, um... Yeah. Praise me. Praise me. I'm, I'm, ju I'm just saying, modern... D DVDs today do not have the, the level of bonus features that that was on. Anyway, let's get started. <laughs> Um, welcome back. This is the infamous hack fraud show. We are in an infamous time. It is good to be an infamous podcast. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For now. And we are recording on day three. Day three. <laughs> of the apocalypse. Day three of the apocalypse. Uh, so, hey, right. the, the Oscar nominations, well, they're, they're not out at the time we're recording this, but by the time this comes out, the Oscar nominations will be out, so... That's something to look forward and to. And we're all going to learn to hate La La Land so in a few months. I, I so think, I think I can say with, with some level of confidence, uh, it's pretty cool that uh, La La Land got all those nominations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really cool. It, it is quite it's the cool. first movie to be nominated for everything. <laughs> okay, Literally well, everything. I'm not... How, uh, nominations are, wait, how, many, how many nominations are there? I, Too many. I don't know how many a single movie can get because... Uh, I think 11. It's about that, or... No, it's definitely more than 11. Um, I mean, obviously there are categories that some movies will not be eligible for, such as uh, right. the legendary documentary short subject. But <laughs> I think the the record for most nominations by a single movie is uh, 14. Okay. That's but I like think the number of Oscar wins is 11, and yeah. it's shared by Ben-Hur, Titanic, and Return of the King. Yeah. Um, this is going to be the new Titanic. It's going to win all these awards, and then there's going to be an entire generation of people just hating it because it's like this super uncynical look at something. Well, I, I don't want to hate that. I don't want to hate it either. I mean, a, award season is going to make me sick of it. This is just something I've accepted. But well, no, th well, this is just going to be the backlash. That's just what's going to happen. Granted, I'll, I'll be rooting for Moonlight all the way. It's going to be a losing battle, but I'm going to be rooting for it. Um, I'll be rooting for it, too, so... Good job. <laughs> Maybe it'll win Best Adapted Screenplay. I pray. I pray. Um, I think it will. All right, so this week uh, we looked at some of the work of the other Studio Ghibli director. <laughs> uh, that would be uh, Isao Takahata. There's like three... Ghibli director that, that anyone actually knows. There's Miyazaki, his son, and Iso Takahata. <laughs> uh, yeah. His son isn't very good at it. Oh. From what I, I don't think I've ever seen one of his movies. Hasn't his son like only directed one movie? I, I think he directed two. Okay. All I right. think they were Tales of Earthsea, widely regarded as the by far the worst Ghibli movie, <laughs> and A Hot Poppy Hill. Oh, what, what fun. Um... <laughs> But first, uh, the usual question, what's everybody been watching? <laughs> Reed, let's start with you. What, what have you been watching? Um, actually, let's start with John. John. <laughs> um, I watched a few things um, this weekend, um, one of which was a Brazilian-directed, French-language, 41-minute experimental film from 1934 called uh, Zero for Conduct. I had to watch it for a class. Was that, uh, was that a Bun Bunuel film? No, that's not, but that's Virgo. Oh, okay. It's... I kind of like it. <laughs> like, it's, 
it's been technically it's just a fucking mess, but some of the imagery is really pretty. Like he's he doesn't know how to edit it together, but there's a really nice sense of there's really nice compositions here and there. Um, it's pretty funny. There's a slow motion because it takes place in like this boarding school, and like there's just because like Virgo was an anarchist, of course. There's like this boarding school revolution where they like they like tie headmasters to the chairs and like they 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 smash up pillows and there's this slow motion scene of them parading somebody on a chair as feathers fall down and (laughs) it's not for everyone but you know what it was a lot of fucking fun and it's only 41 minutes sounds like a literally nothing to lose Wow. I say we should do that for the podcast. <laughs> uh, we won't. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say um to to quote John a little bit. No. <laughs> well, I, I saw it with two people from my class, and one of them just said, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> She's right. I have no clue either. Um, I watched less than an hour of Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice, the <laughs> Ultimate Edition. I'm surprised you watched any of it. Um, Alex and Matthew made me. Oh. And at one point, I just quit and made them watch some of the old 1940 Superman cartoons because I just couldn't take it. <laughs> and those are great. Those are those are great, silly animated action. Um, where do we all stand on Man of Steel? Hate it. I'm going to take a Trumpian esque opinion because I have not seen this movie. <laughs> I'm going to say that the lead actor is overrated. <laughs> and then obviously what? Superman doesn't fucking kill people. Yeah, so. yeah I, actually, my issues with that movie don't stem from uh, Henry Cavill. Because, like, he's charming as fuck in The Man from Uncle. <laughs> he, is a, he can be a really charming person, and to see him, like, like Zack Snyder has no idea what he's doing. Okay. I it, realized this while watching Batman, I'm, I'm gonna try and focus this, I realized this while watching Batman be Superman, is that Zack Snyder sees him as the villain. Zack Snyder sees him as, like, some vision of Stalinism. Like, the, there's, like, the statue to him, and it looks like something that could be in the Moscow Metro. And, like, every, like all the questions surrounding him are, aren't like, oh, Superman, you save people. It's like, you are have no right as a person to decide what we think. You, you are curtailing our freedom. Like, they treat him... Like he's some communist dictator in the movie, and like, and Batman is like this freedom fighter, and it is just the strangest thing. <laughs> um, the strangest thing. John, I, I, I don't think it's a controversial statement to say Zack Snyder wildly uh, misunderstands Superman. No, no, I, I just, it just how misjudged it is. It, it is fascinating just how off the mark it is. It's interesting because people tend to accuse him of like promoting kind of a an Ayn Randian vision with, with these like, movies. Well, he, he apparently, one of his passion projects is he wants to make the Fountainhead into a movie. Oh boy. So like, we know where his allegiance stands. And with that worldview, of course you think Superman's horrifying. Like, <laughs> like all through Batman v Superman, all I can think is like, this man's worldview is horrifying. I, I can't really say anything more about it because, I, I, of course, I didn't fucking finish it. Like, the editing's terrible. It's terribly shot. Everyone has... Like, it is... Zack Snyder clearly can't direct actors. So what you have is, like, this green screen apocalypse and people just staring into the middle distance. There's no expression on their fucking face. It's awful. No one should ever see it. All right, well, that that's the closest thing to an actual opinion we will ever get from John on Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice. Um, I think it's better than Man of Steel. Oh, because it's, it, it's it's more interesting than Man of Steel. Oh, Man of <laughs> hard line disagree on that. No, this is my thing about Man. At least from Batman v Superman, I was able to get like Superman is some like Stalinist dictator and like the awful worldview. Man of Steel is horrifying, but also just extremely boring. Well, it's even more boring than Batman v Superman. Well, you didn't sit through the whole thing of Batman v Superman, no, so no. I. Uh... I'm only going off like an hour of like this fucking fucking three hours. Moving on, I also def- I also watched a much fucking better movie, um, Alexander Payne's About Schmidt. Oh yes, because I recommended you watch Three Colors Blue, and then apparently you watched. 
this is a movie that's been on my list for a little while because Alexander Payne's a really interesting director. Mm-hmm. I adore Jack Nicholson, and I adore um, disillusioned businessman types. It's it's just a perfect niche, and it's really fucking great. Yeah. I, I, a really interesting thing about Alexander Payne is that he fills his movies with characters who are a lot like like upper middle class suburban dads, mm. and then makes them go through existential crises. Which is like the Jack Nick, Jack Nicholson is so perfect for this role because he's being surrounded with the medio the mediocrity of his surroundings. He's like he's like wearing schlubby, like wearing like dad clothes, and he's playing he's pretty much playing like somebody's average dad. But there's always like he's he always sounds like it seems like he's just hiding anger. Like at any moment he could just explode, and sometimes he does, mm-hmm. and like that's just really. <laughs> it's both really depressing and yet really funny to watch. It's a fascinating movie. John, all this makes me wonder uh, if you would like uh, American Beauty, which is a movie that I really do not like very much, but it, it seems to fit into that very niche you're describing. What, like uh, disillusioned businessmen types who are like yeah. my dad? D- disillusioned bus- businessmen types... Uh, in suburbia, experiencing existential crises, and it even has Kevin Spacey. The, well, Alexander Payne, like, he's, there's such a sense that like he is, he grew up in this environment, and he, it's the only environment he knows. But he's just so dissatisfied with it; he just hates it so much. Well, Alexander Payne, I think, is far less pretentious than uh, whoever wrote uh, American Beauty. Yeah, Al- maybe Alan Ball, uh, who I think. directed American Beauty? Uh, that would be Sam Mendes of uh, Skyfall fame. I'm not sure about that because, well, granted, like Sam Mendes is a lesser direct is a lesser filmmaker than Alexander Payne. So, Ooh. Ooh. well, is that a controversial statement? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, look, Alexander Payne. No, I think he's great. Uh, I think we need to watch Sideways for the podcast at some point. Oh, yeah, another watch Sideways. What's another one? I you said Nebraska was great. Nebraska, I think, is really good. Um, I also recommend The Descendants, um, if you haven't seen mm. that. I, I'd be willing to put him on the dock because he's fascinating. I, I, I really I really like Alexander Payne. Yeah. And the two movies I've seen from him. <laughs> uh, oh, have you only seen Election and... Uh... I've, seen, I've only seen Election and About Schmidt. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, uh, anything else that uh, you would like to discuss? Um, I think that's everything. Very odd week. Yeah. Very odd. Too too true. Uh, Reed, uh, <laughs> yes. what what have you been up to in the in the watching department? So I had a strange opportunity to revisit a nineteen eighty. I think it's eighty nine, eighty eighty seven. Tim Burton's Batman. Ooh. Ooh. How was that experience? Um, you know I. It really is a movie about the Joker, but they do give some leeway to Michael Keaton's character. I, I kind of like that about the movie, where it's like Michael Keaton is an enigma through the whole thing. In the deluge of Batman movies we we have been, we've been given, I think the Tim Burton Batman movies are at least very interesting. I'm not too sure how also they stack quality wise. Also, the you know, aside from the twenty million in cash thrown in the streets, the two hundred birthday parade is lame as shit. <laughs> yeah, there's an odd kind of like set bound feeling to those movies. It's which is interesting. Yeah. Did Did you watch anything else? Um, I watched another episode of that European cop show, The Tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Did, didn't that show get an American remake? Because I'm pretty sure I saw ads for, for a show called The Bridge, which seems to have a similar premise. Is that right? I think, I, I think, I think that's more based off the, the original Swedish version, but possibly. If it has to deal with two cops from different countries solving a murder that it, that where the crime scene is halfway through on some bridge slash tunnel, mm. then it then all follows the same type of premise. You're right. It was based on a, a, a Swedish show. This is just all over my head. <laughs> well, all you, head. you, uh, John, I'm sure you were not avidly watching uh, reruns of J.J. Abrams' Star Trek on FX when you were <laughs> in high school. Um, uh, no. No. Anyway, um... So that's that, huh? Uh, <laughs> what have you been watching? 
Well, let's see. Uh, the saga of... Um, so my history of international film class is just going to be a recurring thread for the next several weeks. Um, it's like, what the fuck it shows you? Uh, yes, this week we watched uh, Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin. Uh, Ooh, influential. I, I just think it's so strange how 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 we like look to like these Soviet propaganda films as like yeah. how how pioneering they were in terms of, of filmmaking technique. I view them on pure technical terms, and on pure technical terms they're rather impressive, but that, that is true. I I can't say I like them. <laughs> for for a silent movie made in 1925, it's rather impressive technically. Um, if, any, if you want to see like another a, a really bad shit Soviet Soviet uh, propaganda movie, there's also Sergei Eisenstein's October, <laughs> which has like him cutting between like imperial officers and a mechanical peacock. It's <laughs> it's um, absolutely. Fun. I, I, I think I'm good, but um, I will say this. Um, we watched that movie the morning of the inauguration, and uh, boy howdy, a Russian movie about a populist uprising was really not what I needed that day. <laughs> but um, that uh, that was that. We're, so The Soviet era is going to be subject to a brand new lens of history now, <laughs> for yeah. better and for worse. Um, so that was that. I also watched uh, the first installment of uh, Krzysztof Kieslowski's uh, Three Colors Trilogy. I think I pronounced his name correctly. Uh, Let's pray. That would be uh, Blue, starring Juliette Binoche. Very, very good. Quite, quite, an, quite an excellent movie. Um, quite a beautiful thing. Um, they utilize music very well. It's shot just beautifully. Um, Juliette Binoche gives an outstanding performance. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, very anxious to see the other two installments. Uh, what if, like, if for each color they do like like liberty, fraternity? Yeah. The, um, the next installment I believe is white, uh, which features uh, Julie Delpy uh, from Richard Linklater's uh, Before trilogy. So I'm excited to see that. Speaking of Richard Linklater, I also saw his uh, big big time breakout movie Slacker. You see. Right. No, I, I, I had not. Uh, I've seen several of his movies. Uh, you might be thinking of Dazed and Confused. Yeah. But uh, Slacker is interesting because the conceit of that movie is like you don't really spend more than a few minutes with any character. You just kind of bounce around like all these different people um, in this like one town in Texas. Um, and... You know, I really like Richard Linklater. This movie really did not do it for me. I think his his character work is usually very strong, and I think it is possible to argue that you get to know some of these people very well uh, over the course of just a few minutes, but to me this movie just felt like watching an episode of Saturday Night Live. Like, some of the material worked, some of it didn't, and it, doesn't. it was kind of hit or miss uh, overall. I've only seen one Richard Linklater film, and I didn't like it, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I think that before sunrise, before sunset, and before midnight are all spectacular in, in very different ways, and I I think he's a very interesting director. Even his, like, stab at mainstream comedy, like um, School of Rock, uh, is a movie that I really, really like. Uh, and then, what else? Oh. Silence. I, hmm? Silence. Oh, right. We didn't... Well, okay, I'll save that. Just one more thing first. Uh, I saw... Um, I At some point uh, this past week, I realized I had somehow gone a full calendar year without watching uh, The Social Network, my, my favorite <laughs> movie of all time. So I... Uh, I had to I had to watch that uh, to ring in uh, 2017 officially. Some, I, I had not watched that movie since I started college. And... Let me say this. That movie, as as great as I always thought it was, that movie gets a whole lot better when you're after you're you've been in college. <laughs> like that that scene where where the Winklevi go to the the president of Harvard and to, to try to get him to to go after Mark Zuckerberg. That scene like I finally understood it. I'm like, "Oh, it's like completely ridiculous that they thought this would work." <laughs> That 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 all finally made sense to me. You know, 
what I need? I need to. I think the last time I saw it was your like viewing party of it, and I, I need to give that movie a closer look. Yeah. yeah. So Social Network still like perfect movie. Um, still a good movie. Yes. Uh, and then yes, I finally saw Martin Scorsese's two-hour, forty-minute epic, Silence, aka Andrew Garfield looking sad for two hours <laughs> and forty minutes. John, well, a little bit of Adam Driver here and there. It's Liam Neeson. Eh. I get the feeling what's about to happen. I uh, did not enjoy this movie very much. <laughs> Oh no. See, oh, no. for me, I walked out of that movie and after sitting in like a weird theater for 240 minutes, I'm like, what the fuck did I just watch? I. Yeah, you kind of feel that way too? I. Look. <laughs> uh, Let it all out, man. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't work for Scorsese. I'm not. I saw this movie less than a week ago and. It's already, like, fading in my mind. I, I was really... It just did not click with me for, for whatever reason. Mm. Do, you, what, do you think it was due to, like... Because there are there's some holes. Like, I'm not going to say it's a perfect... I'm never going to say it's a perfect movie. But, like... Like, there's the fake port, Portuguese accents. Um, how Adam Driver probably should have been in the Andrew Garfield role, but wasn't. Oh, yeah. Um... Like just how long it is. My biggest thing it's with I'll never forget. <laughs> yeah, good, good for you, I guess. Um, my biggest like thing, to... the ending to me kind of felt like a cop out. Uh, mm. Where yeah, like the end yeah. with the cross, where where Jesus uh, finally like speaks to him, like, "Go ahead, step on me. It's okay." <laughs> I, I that that really for some for whatever reason did did not work for me, and then that that just extended denouement where it like shows him like just getting old in Japan like yeah. I don't know why that needed to be there. It's a movie that keeps trying to undermine what you think you know. You think you think he is remitted, but it's so clear. It's fairly clear he hasn't still. But the movie gives. It keeps trying to undermine what any concrete opinion you might have about this character, which is sort of the nature of faith. It's really difficult to nail down who has it, what the nature of it. Grant, I, I'm not, I, I don't know, man. Like, the fucking scene where Liam Neeson sits down with him and says, like, and just points to the son and says, that's what we had to tell them was the son of God. There was no... Mm. The Japanese cannot understand Christianity without any ties to... To the natural world, like we we had to legitimately change the religion to preach it here. That's a good scene. I, I, I think that's fascinating. That's I think. that's a very good scene. I really like Liam Neeson in this movie and and what he does. God, I wish there were not a two fucking hours before he comes back in. Yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna. I, it, it, it's too long. Like I think there were some like fascinating things throughout it, but there are just some things that are like. I don't need this much Andrew Garfield torture porn. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I don't need it. I don't need all of it. I can have some of it. I don't need all of it. I, I get... This is like the second movie in a row where I think where Scorsese is like deliberately like dragging things out to make it excessive. But man, yeah. I'm not sure that works as well as he thinks it does. I don't know. I, I think this movie's like undeniably fascinating. I, I think this the experience of watching this movie is an experience I just did not get at any other point this year. Like, this movie has some of the most disturbing imagery, I think, of anything this year. Yeah. yeah no, there, there, there is undeniably powerful stuff in this movie. I just think, after a while, I started to get numb to it, and it just... I don't know, man. I love Scorsese. I'm glad he got to make this movie. You know, it's been burning within him for, like, 30 years. So now I just want to see him make a, make a fun movie again. <laughs> I know, it's like the, it's Scorsese's passion. The, we we've been talking about this like passion projects. It's either yay or nay. There's that, that they can often turn out badly. But I think like there's just some undeniably fascinating stuff in this movie. Like it's musings on not only religion but like our cultural understandings of religion and how like. Religion is kind of an, we use religion as an ambassador for Western culture and how the Japanese 
are stamp are stamping it out to kind of say like we know what you're doing here. You're not trying to spread your faith. You're just here like the spread your culture here. We will not allow that. Yeah, and my other thing is that I I think like Christian missionaries have been responsible for some horrible horrible things. I, I don't think this is a controversial thing. Um, no. So I, don't, I, think, I think the movie realizes that. Yeah. I don't know if it realizes it maybe as much as it should. Well, it's it's not really about it's not really about that. But I think like the Japanese do the re, the the reasons the and there's a lot of just the Japanese telling Andrew Garfield why they are doing what they are doing. The ja- the reasons the Japanese give are all the reasons we kind of teach in history class of like why Christian missionaries were such an awful thing. Mm. But um, regard. But regardless, it, I think it's fascinating. It's a fascinating movie to talk about, and I I would like to continue this conversation, but we have some Takahata movies to talk about. Yes. Oh, goodness. Um, I saw Takahata, um, the other Ghibli director. The um, Apparently he can neither draw nor animate, yet he is a director of animation. <laughs> well, that, that might, <laughs> that might uh, clear up... Uh, some stuff here because I think that that explains a lot for me. It's so interesting because like his work seems to have gotten like more and more flat and spare, like as it's gone on. Mm -hmm. And especially like in the the tale of the princess Kaguya, it's just like white backgrounds, like charcoal works. Yeah. You can see that in both of these movies, like in grave of the fireflies that has a very like deliberate purpose, I think just because like, I mean, Grave of the Fireflies is one of his more, I think, lushly animated movies. Really? Yeah, it's... Really? Uh, by comparison. Well, like it's, it's got more, like, I think, like, especially looking at Only Yesterday, like, the flashback stuff, there's, like, a lot of white, there's a lot yeah. of, like, simple... Color. Like, like the, the ending, where, like, the little the little version of her comes up, and you can see, like, the clear difference in colors. Mm. That's really interesting. Yeah, like, in, in Only Yesterday, like, the the flashbacks are all like very stylized and kind of abstract and the backgrounds are all like painted in watercolor. Um, yeah. that's, that's all very interesting. Um, where, where do we want to start? I don't know. I, and I just want to say, and then the other thing is that I think it's interesting that he is like making, you know, animated movies like about things that you would generally not make animated movies about. He's an adult director. He, these are movies for an, an adult Japanese audience. Yeah. And that's something that's a little bit rarer in Ghibli's lineup. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm guessing you were you were somewhat underwhelmed, uh, but judging by... Um, let's start with Grave of the Fireflies, because that's one I think I have the most to Um, I, this is the first, I remember I first watched this movie, I think in either, like, Early senior year or like late junior year of high school, it was the first Ghibli movie I'd ever seen. Mm. We'll put that out of the way. And I remember thinking, why isn't this live action? Because like, especially considering like now we have I have like the winds the wind rises for comparisons, and I and I don't want to make do make this entire episode us comparing the Miyazaki because we shouldn't do that. Like, he's a director; yeah. he can stand on his own. We there, don't need to compare. Yeah, they're. To it. They're Absolutely. very different. They have very different sensibilities. But it is because they are working with a lot of the same stable of animators. Their designs are similar. The backgrounds are similar. How they're animated is kind of similar. So, like the clear lack of imagination visually from Takahata is really apparent in this one. Yes. Like I, I remember seeing like there's the scene where is like the aunt comes in and they're like, well. You should sell your mother's kimonos for rice. We need more. We need more food. And the little and the seppuku, like I, I have no fucking clue what her name is. Um, the little sister comes up. It's like no, no, don't take those. Those are moms. And don't please don't take the like some sentiment. sentiment uh, she has a sentimental value towards those. And those are animated in like this weird medium shot, where it's like they're kind of obstructed in the door frame. And I'm like, whose idea was this? This is what are we supposed to get from this visual? It's also a case where I am going to describe this movie as a morality tale. It is a morality tale about World War II Japan and a tale about pride, about the cost of pride, about like the jingoism that's apparent in the Japanese war effort and how that led them to ruin. Like there's some like 
some of the ideas of Japanese fascism is this idea of like self-reliance and like we will stand on our own. We do not need the outside world, and that's really apparent in this kid. Yeah, but they don't really him and that sister really don't have much kid. They seem like objects for they they are objects for this morale to play. And in a short and like in, in like a thirty minute short, I'd say that's okay. But in a 90-minute movie where, like, our emotional connection, our, our involvement is with these characters, and they just, to me, feel like tools to an end, that's a fail. I, yeah, that's, like, my biggest issue is that, like, for all its, and I, I think it's a very admirable movie. It's a movie from a different side of the conflict, the Japanese side. Uh, but, like, just on, like, a pure emotional level, it just does not work. Like there's a clear like lack of imagination. It, 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 it's it's weirdly without life. It is just strangely lifeless. And I I'll let y'all go into that before I dive any deeper. Well, um, yikes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hot takes. I. Hot takes. I mean, I was also somewhat underwhelmed by this movie. I mean, but I. Yeah. I don't think that this movie I honestly think that this is a more interesting take on this story than than could be done in live action. I think if they did this story in live action it would be like almost unwatchable. It, it's it's a very devastating story and it, it, I don't know. I mm. like there's like some like really grotesque depictions of like rash and yeah and starvation. Oh yeah effects that has on your body yeah i i i don't know man i i I think that this movie um is very yeah i was somewhat underwhelmed by it but it's it's tough to talk about just because i think there is there is such a um i think there is an emotional like attachment that that i get at least um and I don't know why I'm finding it so hard to, to talk about this because I, I I was not but super on paper should all be there. I was not super entertained by it, but no. I do think there is an undeniable power to this movie, and I definitely think that doing this this story in an animated format is uh, I think there's something to that. I, I certainly admire it. Like uh, I think one of the re- I heard one of the reasons they made this movie was first of all the guy who wrote it this is kind of autobiographical mm. like he, he obviously didn't die but like his sister died and like this is kind of his version of apologizing for that um like takahata made it because like at this point japan had a really bad juvenile crime issue and there was like this huge rift between generations and this was like there's the final shot of this movie is like him uh, looking at over like this modern city and it's colored like fireflies and this yeah. idea that like this booming economy you have kids it's gonna burst so like hunker down this will all end and you have to prepare for that remember what the generation before you went through and that's really admirable uh read what do you think you've been kind of um, yeah so you know, when I saw, ooh, Studio Chili movie, okay, go, cool. good, good. But when I got to the end, it's like, well, that was a huge steaming pile of meh. But I will say, I, I, I found, I finally found what I could, what I could actually call this movie in like a weird John Oliver esque soundbite, to which I call it a, a, a more jingo edition of the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> I, it's. Entirely right. It's difficult to talk about this movie because, like, it's kind of culturally important. Like, a lot of people use this movie as like animation can be serious, and rightly so. It's a movie about like again, like it's a movie about a perspective we don't see in the West, which is mm-hmm. the Japanese side of the conflict. That's that's where, and to see it depicted like this is really interesting. Well, I mean, most of the movie is concentrated on you know on like the state of poverty and the state of desperation. It's about children starving to death. That's, I, I guess, like, to me, one of my biggest issues with it is that, like, because, like, again, I said before, like, he 
he's using all like the same stable of animators as Miyazaki does. There's a similar models, there's kind of a similar animation style. And I just think about like their version of like surreality in this movie is to turn everything pink and have like little pink fireflies everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I just think I just think back to like the wind rises, whereas like the fan, which is a which is a another Ghibli World War Two movie about pretty dark stuff. And it's not anywhere near as fucking dark as Grave of the Fireflies, but it's about a man who was involved in the Japanese war effort. And like the fantasy sequences in that are just so much more interesting. There's so much more lively like well Miyazaki's director who just knows how to bring life into his projects well the wind rises was also made in 2013 and grave of the fireflies was one of the first movies that studio ghibli ever produced wasn't it yes but but even if you compare this like a movie these movies came out at the same time my never totoro and grave of the fireflies in some nations this was a double bill um well then i guess i guess totoro was like the the a movie like the way Disney used to make movies, like Totoro was done in the California animation studio and uh, Grave of the Fireflies was done in the Florida animation studio. Yeah. Like, I mentioned, like, the stakes in Totoro are so much lower. That is so much more low-key a movie, yet I care so much more by the time that climax rolls around. I care so much more for those characters. Like, the bit where, like, the sister gets lost has way more impact than anything in Grave for me. And that's, and on, on paper, that shouldn't be the case. Grave of the Fireflies has everything you need for like a really hard-hitting depiction of war that really gets to you. It did feel like it was trying to do that, especially with the, the terrible aunt who's like, oh, oh, you want rice? No. A very human terrible aunt. That's really interesting. We'll get into that. I'll get into this later when we get to only yesterday. Is that like Takahata seems to have a fixation with very human but also kind of abusive families? Yeah, I think it's inter- yeah. like you kind of understand where the ant is coming from, but at the same time, you're like, Jesus Christ! Like these are so kids. Terrible. These are kids that have no family anymore. Like, yeah, that's really in- that's really interesting. But like, she's not in the movie all that much. Uh, yeah, that's not really what the movie's about. And like, it, there's also a really interesting aspect to this movie. When I first watched it, this was part of why I didn't like it, but now I kind of admire it because of this. This is kind of his fault that this happens to him. The... Yeah. The the, the, the sister dying and, like, him starving mm -hmm. to death. This is kind of his fault. Yeah. Like, he could have, in theory, always gone back to the end. Yeah. Or he could have always just stayed. Yeah. Or just stayed in charge. Yeah. Yeah. And, like... That's like an interesting musing on pride. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm stuck too. I'm... I guess this is my ver. I guess kind of how you were with silence. This is this is where I'm at with grave. Where it's like mm-hmm. I can see all the pieces. I can see why people rally behind it. Why people think it's interesting. But like it just it doesn't have that much imagination. Mm-hmm. It's flatly directed. Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah. I, I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm just, like, really glad we have this movie. As, as an example of, of what animation can do, you know, like, I I think, like, the I think one of the Pixar directors said this, like, animation is not a genre. You know, animation is, is a format that too often people consign to, like, only being able to do certain things. And... Fantasy, your children's yeah. blah, blah, blah. And, you know, when you compare, like, Miyazaki's, like, you know, big fantastical adventures to what Takahata is doing, I think mm-hmm. Takahata is, is fascinating, but... I think, like, I, I don't like to compare the two, but it's kind of unavoidable because of they're using the same stable as animators. Yes. Yeah. And it's so clear to see what one does with those tools and what the other can do with those tools. That's, like, I, I don't like doing that, but that's... Watching Takahata movies, I, I keep seeing that. <laughs> that. But like, what is our final thoughts on this? Or do you have like something else? No, to- I mean that that's pretty much it. I just, yeah, I I don't know. I don't think it's a movie I'm going to really come back to. But I'm glad it exists. I think it's got some very very powerful stuff in it, and you know, it, it's 
I I certainly was, you know, like it's tough to watch. And I I did have some certainly some emotional investment in it. So okay. yeah, that's and you were good for like nope. I'm not going to take that away from you because that's uh, in theory I should be able to feel that, but I. It's. <laughs> it's Reed, what do you think? It's worth a watch, is what I'll say. It's. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to I'll get to what I think. Uh, Reed. I think I had some investment in the characters, especially in the especially the smaller one, especially her trying to you know trying to grasp it kind of grasp and survive ultimately for no reason because they could have just stayed which was one of the big things it's like well it's like, yeah uh, but I think the movie uh, like intentionally seeds then you're supposed to really think about that I, I don't I think that I, I thought that was a bug but now I realize that's a feature I sure <laughs> oh yeah like it, right, like you can it is possible just to look and go oh my god this boy's terrible uh, what a, oh my god this boy's terrible <laughs> Okay, not really. On like a pure like film studies level, I really want to recommend this movie because like it's it's important in film history. It's important when you want to understand. It's important when you want to understand like the Jap the Jap- Japanese culture because like uh, Takahata is making movies for Japanese audience in a way that Miyazaki is, and the rest of the Ghibli movies aren't. And that's interesting to see. But I think I think there is a a much better movie made by a much more imaginative director. Whether that's Miyazaki or not, I don't think so. But I, I, I can't help but watch it and think what could have been yeah. in more creative hands. But I still, it's still important. I think it's still something people should watch. So I think I do ultimately Well, the deeper I get into film studies, the more I think that the, the entire field of film studies is just telling people they should watch movies that... Uh, that you don't en- that 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 you don't enjoy, but are are um, Im- important. important. And more and more, I'm learning to enjoy those movies. But yes. this was not one for me. So. All right. Well, let's talk. Uh, let's only talk yesterday. only yesterday. <laughs> A movie I think we all we all enjoyed much much more. Uh, I, I, sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Did you not watch it? No. Okay. Well. <laughs> okay. Only it's yesterday. A movie, it's a much funner movie. Only yesterday, nineteen ninety one. This movie was only released in the U S. like last year, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think one of the reasons I think I heard like I, somebody's explained the reason for me, and I kind of agree with it. That like, how the fuck does would Disney market this thing? <laughs> well, Disney didn't even release it. I think like. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Disney held the rights for a while. Uh, okay. Okay. Disney held the rights, and they're like, "What do you do with Disney?" It's like, "Oh, there's an entire sequence where um, a bunch of elementary schools deal with periods," <laughs> which is a great scene, I think. It's a great scene, yeah. That's a that's a wonderful sequence. I um, think, uh, yeah, um, I think Disney needs to grow the fuck up. Uh, but we uh, that's a conversation for another day. Um, oh yeah, I liked this movie, um, or I, which, I like it too. which is to say, I liked. At least half of it. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I'm kind of with you, but I do think some of the modern framing device works in places. Oh, I, I like, think I think so too. I think like the best scene in this movie is when she is like after like say, "Oh, you should propose to this boy," and she runs out in the rain, and there's the scene where she muses on like a kind of bully from her class, from her old class, and she gets she gets into the car and she just talks. About it, like and like the atmosphere mm. is great. Like there's just rain coming down the car. Like they, they get lost every once in a while. Like they they just like just drive, just drive anywhere. And she just talks about. She also talks about like, do I? I've only been here like for like uh, like a few like a few days. Do I actually like this place? Am I lying to myself to say do I like this place? Is this me? I think all of the best ideas in the movie are cemented in that sequence. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. That's, like, the strongest part of the, like, modern-day kind of framing device. The fa- the flashback stuff, I'm kind of, like, some... It's kind of... They're kind of hit and miss, and we're, like, some of them are just much better than others. <laughs> In regard, like, I think, like, to me, the highlight of them is when she, there's a point where she kind of having a hissy fit. Hmm. 
And like, there's like, well, we're leaving, like kind of classic, oh, we're leaving without you. And they go out and she leaves the house. And like, she's, she's not wearing shoes when she leaves the house. And the, and the like, kind of conservative father goes, no shoes, and just slaps her. Like the button flies off. And it's like this sort of, that's the first time I realized, like, this is kind of an abusive family. In a very human, very subtle way. This is kind of an abusive family who has kind of stopped this girl at a lot of opportunities she could have had. Like, especially, like, the scene where, like, she, they, like, they, with the boy, she's in, like, the little elementary school play, and, like, they, and the college kids come and say, like, hey, can we use her? And the father's like, no. No, you can't do that. Well, I'm like, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's a fine line between, like, you know, looking out for her best interest and, like, just kind of yeah. being more to her detriment, uh, I think. Yeah. Well, when I say abusive, I don't mean insofar as, like, they're beating her all the time. Like, they make a very good point of, like, the time he slaps her, that's the only time that ever happens. Yeah. I mean, like, abusive, like, in a very subtle, very mm. creeping way. Yeah. It, to the point that you don't realize it until near the end of the movie, that the kind of nature of the family that this is. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, I think the, the flashbacks um, are great. I think yeah. they they yeah. work wonders, and they they do a very good job of showing just what a different person you you can become when you when you as when you grow up, like just how different. That's something I think about a lot. Um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Just how how much you you change as a person, just from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, and. Yeah. That's just a topic that just fascinates me, not least because yeah, of my own personal experiences with that. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people, like anyone who's thought any, any who has actually thought about their childhood has come across this. It's also like, these are about the prettiest parts of the movie. Yeah. Like, some the colors are great, like the sort of like faded, sort of white watercolor background. They're just great. Yeah. And between that and like, you know the 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 flashbacks are done in like a much more like abstract kind of fantastical mode, uh, which I really liked. Yeah, and I like there's that part where like she's talking to that boy, um, and like uh, after they have their conversation, she kind of runs away and just kind of starts flying. Uh, yes, that yes, that's little, that's, little that's a beautiful little image. That's a beautiful sequence. Um, yeah. The the modern day stuff works less well for me. I think you kind of pointed this out. Like it's. Musings on like agricultural life are kind of bullshit. bullshit. No, yeah, like it, it's, it's it's this movie that has like this perfect idealist view of the countryside, and I'm like, I've lived with country people. None of this is true. <laughs> None of this is even slightly true. Well, I can't speak as to how that works in Japan, but no, but I doubt I doubt it's similar. I think the rural urban divide exists in just about any developed country. Yeah, and then um, just the ending of this movie. I think it really does pick up toward the end where like the, yes. the, the flashbacks and the modern day stuff kind of just bleeds together. Um, yeah. and that, that all works, I think really, really well. And then at the end when they, the, the young like flashbacks just kind of invade her, <laughs> yes, her, yeah, the yeah. real world. Yes, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I, you know, just, just talking about this movie, uh, I think I actually like really, really appreciated and, and liked it. Yeah. I am going to say it's not the most wildly entertaining thing. Yeah, I mean, coming off of it, I was kind of like, yeah, parts of it were good. But, like, just talking about it, I think I'm, I'm kind of coming around to really, really yeah, appreciating I think it. It's, it's a really interesting movie to talk. It's, it's, more, it's one of these movies that's more interesting to talk about than it really is to watch. Mm. I'd say so. And, that's, I, and I think that's, and that's not, I, I don't think that's really a pejorative, to be honest. It's, it's kind of like, I think it's a movie yeah. that's supposed to sustain conversation and sustain and supposed to make you think about the things it's talking about. I don't think it's, it's not here to jangle keys in front of you and try and entertain you. And <laughs> it, of course it's like, it's, it's Ghibli. So it's really gorgeous. Like granted, like just, they apparently, I heard some about how they did like the modern day stuff. Like the, like the flashback stuff is really cartoony, mm -hmm. but the modern day stuff, they like, they drew to the voices instead of the other way around where the voices were just added on later. Mm. And like, they tried to make the mouth movements really realistic. Right. And which, which to be clear, much. which to be clear, Japanese animation, usually the voices are done after the animation is already done. And like, I'm sorry, like the mouth, the mouth, they just, 
really unnatural sometimes. <laughs> it just, I don't think it works. Like, I get the effort. That's a good on you, Ghibli, but oh, it's unnatural. <laughs> well, you know, that didn't it's, really bother me. Uh, it, it, it's hardly a deal breaker, but it's something I'm like, oh, it's uncomfortable to watch for me. No. I, I, I definitely recommend this movie. I, I think it's fascinating to see someone doing a, a realistic drama about childhood and adulthood in animated yes, form. I like the two are both very different, but also kind of made each other. Like how the experiences from there, you've also build, you build upon them and how you just kind of forget them. Mm -hmm. And like how they're so, and how so different that stuff. Is, like, that's a really interesting. Divide. I just think it's fascinating how, like, like, when I started college, like, I found myself just flooded with a bunch of childhood memories that I hadn't thought about in years, and to see that kind of happen to, to, uh, Taiko, uh, the, the protagonist of this movie, to see that happen to her yeah, was a very, a very profound a thing for me. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's, it, I, yeah, I recommend it. I think it's, it's really, it's really interesting, like, it's, it's got a structure I don't think I've seen before. Hmm. Whereas, like, it's kind of, it's not kind of like the, it's built on, it's flashbacks, but, like, there's the spine of modern day, but, like, the two are, sometimes the flashbacks are really, well, there's kind of how much screen time they take up really varies, it's a, a strange sort of mix, and I think it's, it's really interesting to watch, I think it really comes on its own at the end, like, I was kind of meh on it coming up to that ending, but, like, that scene where they're in the car and the rain's coming down, that just really sold it for me, and I was like, I get it! Yeah. I, I get it! Yeah. Also, I still have the theme song for uh, Hyotori Pumpkin Island stuck in my head. <laughs> I think it, I, I, I'm not too sold on it, but I think it has all the ingredients of a great movie. I think, I think, I think, a lot, I think quite a few people could go yeah. into this. Like, if, if you're not looking for, like, specific, like, really defined 3X structure, or, like, or you just kind of it's kind of slice of life, but also kind of musings on that as well. Yeah, it's less straightforward than you might think. Yeah, um, yeah. I I think this is a movie that I'm going to be thinking about a lot um, going forward. Yeah, it's, it's something worth thinking about. Um, so there we are. We we watched <laughs> two interesting movies. Um, I really don't know what to think about Iso Takahata, to be honest. Yeah, it's interesting. I I'm kind I kind of want to look into more of his stuff. Uh, granted, he really hasn't directed that many movies, but yeah, it's, it's the Miyazaki Company. It's gonna you want to look for others. It's certainly I think it's interesting to see that Studio Ghibli is not just the Hayao Miyazaki show. Uh, yeah, but also kind of is in some. I, I think know. there's like some some like fascinating power dynamics in the studio, and I think that like. I think for Ghibli has made better. I think the movies Ghibli's made some better movies, but I think Pixar is a more interesting studio that's just more that has just more diversity and more things going for it. And like and the whole, I, I think like the, the meritocracy of Ghibli is so built upon the foundation of Miyazaki, and you have people like Takahata, but even he can't truly escape the shadow of Miyazaki. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is because, like, we want to talk about him as a director. We want to talk about him on his own, but we can't help but talk about, like, it's the company of Miyazaki. We can't help but compare the two. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I just think, you know, I, I agree, like, it's hard, but I do think Takahata should be judged on his own terms as a very yeah. interesting filmmaker. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, especially, you know, only yesterday is, like, a, it's fascinating. Yeah. So... That's my two cents. Um, Ghib Ghibli, uh, Studio Ghibli's fascinating. Yeah. yeah Studio yes. Ghibli's fascinating. All their movies are worth, I think, mm, the grand majority of their, their movies are worth watching one way or another. So. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad to, uh, that we might go even deeper down this uh, rabbit hole at some point. At some point, but not next week, I think, because oh. I've got an idea. I had an idea too, but I want I want you to start. Okay. Um, ha have either of you seen Groundhog Day? Yes, I have not. Because I the actual day, Groundhog Day, is coming up, and <laughs> I thought maybe because I watched Groundhog Day last year and loved it, and I would love a chance to to rewatch it. So. 
I'd be on board. I, I've never seen Groundhog Day. I've heard nothing but good about it. What's uh, what was your idea there, John? Well, my idea was Carol Reed. Oh, okay. <laughs> That was my idea. The, the, the kind of continue, the kind of quasi foreign king. Well, we've we've got some time for that before. Uh, and those movies are shorter. Before other things come up, but so. Well, well what would we pair with Groundhog Day? I, I might say. Well, that's interesting. We could. Um, I'm sure there's some random movie we could find that would. Uh, I have some kind of a list going. Um, are, there, are there any like Bill Murray movies? Acclaimed Bill Murray movies we've missed. Uh, yeah. Not that I can think Life of. Life Aquatica? Oh, God. Life I, do, <laughs> I do not want to watch The Life Aquatic. Hey, man, I, I, I think <laughs> we are like the Vidiots, and I think at one point we will collide <laughs> on The Life Aquatic. <laughs> I, I don't I think. I see that. I mean, I... All right. Do, you know what? If you want to do it, I'll do it. I will rewatch. Wes Anderson's oh, no, The Life dude. Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Oh, no. Oh, no. Mm. Just think of... Oh, well, idiots, I didn't want it to end this soon. <laughs> just think of this. Just, just think of this as fencing practice and that the real battle exists with swords. But we're just going to practice with those little sailors and just punch each other. I... I... <laughs> Because this is strange, because this is a, a director that we both adore. Yes. We both adore Wes Anderson. We both adore the dollhouse universe of Wes Anderson. Yes. Yet this is a divide that, that we are like deeply divided on this movie, of all things. Um, I, I will try to prepare it. Well, actually, you know what? I'm not, I'm not too sure what I'm going to think of. Life Aquatic coming up. Watch. I think this would be like the third time I've watched it. I've seen it twice and I've loved it both times. What? <laughs> I'm just, Are you just looking at me like I'm just crazy? I'm just not looking forward to this at all. We don't have to watch it. We don't have to do it again. I mean, if you if you just shit, this is a this is a podcast about enrichment. And if you see there is no opportunity for enrichment in this, we can just bail. I would just rather watch something I haven't seen. I think the idea of of, of watching. Two movies that I've seen already is is okay. 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 Well, Reed, Reed, if you want to watch Life Aquatic on your own time, by all means, go for it. Okay, well, we can spar. Okay, let's let's. Oh my God! Uh. <laughs> you dug, you dug yourself a trench, and you're desperately trying to take it I don't know what else you do with Groundhog Day. I haven't seen Groundhog Day. I'm not too sure what the kind of movie it is. I we just, could just say fuck it and do a Carol Reed movie with it. I just thought we could pair a <laughs> random movie with Groundhog Day. So we're doing a Carol Reed movie? No, I think no. we should. I think Carol Reed deserves his own week. Okay. All right, Reed. Do you really, really want an excuse to watch Life Aquatic? <laughs> you're go- you're going back into the trench. What are you doing? I think because uh, okay, because only because that I am on the edge of a cliff. You're down in a trench, but I have a thirty foot ladder with me, and I don't necessarily want to give you that ladder so you can climb out. <sighs> no, no, you know what? No, I need. I want to give Life Aquatic one more chance. So you because okay. I'm giving you can get out of this. You do you really want to do this? Let's 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 say this. If I reserve the right to bail on this movie a half hour in if I'm not you just don't want to. Yes. Okay. I will give you that right. What is and our fucking backup? That's the thing about like that's the issue of doing going down the Wes Anderson hole because I think like the only Wes Anderson movie I haven't seen is um the first, oh God, what's the first? Bottle Rocket. Bottle Rocket. I haven't seen Bottle Rocket. Tell you what, let's make Bottle Rocket our backup. Okay. Because I saw that movie fairly recently, and I can, I, I think I can talk about it. Um, and that'll be enriching, if nothing else. So, yeah, that'll be, at least for me. Uh, Reed, have you even watched that movie yet? Bottle Rocket? <laughs> Judging by oh, it, short read. Don't worry about judging it. by the look on his face, I'm going to take that as a no. Um, Life Aquatic was longer. To to be clear, 
Reed bought Bottle Rocket Sight Unseen <laughs> at Barnes & Noble's Criterion half-off sale and still has not watched it. All right, so next week we're definitely watching Groundhog Day. Yep, that's set in stone. And, and maybe Life Aquatic? And maybe Life Aquatic maybe. and maybe Bottle Rocket. I imagine we'll end up talking about all three, probably. Possibly. I, I, I'll pro- cause I've, I think I've seen Life Aquatic fairly recently as well. I might just, I might just go out and do Bottle Rocket. Okay. All right. So, good God, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> I, gave, I gave you the opportunity. Well, I just think, because we've been on a real hot streak of, like, watching interesting movies that I haven't seen, and I drug it back to territory that I'm pretty familiar yeah, that with. Yeah, you're but familiar with. Uh, it's, it'll be, th- this is where we always drag everything back to at some point. Like Whatever. Uh, we can, we can use a bit of a break here. Um it's- it's it's good to talk. It's good to have to be able to talk about movies you have background with. All right. So okay. All right. We'll see you back here for quasi Bill Murray week. Uh, soon kind enough. Kind of, sort of, sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, that's how everything happened. That's what every. That's what this room. This room is a meme factory. That's just what it is. You're right. Yeah. It turns into especially when you add Matthew in the mix. He's the he's an exclusive meme lord. <laughs> He was in the movie. He was great. He, he was there chomping on on somebody's picnic while while in a truck. Um, part of me wants to defend Watchmen, but like after seeing this, I'm like, man, <laughs> this fucking guy. I have to say, John, you for someone who hates Zack Snyder as much as you do, you are surprisingly willing to defend his his Watchmen movie. <laughs> Watchmen, maybe. Maybe I'll have to get off that train. Who knows? I think it's something that strays really close to the source material. It looks visually nice. I think there's stuff to defend in it. Um, it... Never mind. Um... <laughs> what, me? Yes. Oh, okay. No, the um... other read. What about Rock the Casbah? Read. <laughs> no. I just, oh, I'm shutting that shit down.